cycle of Metoic is the three-dimensional relationship of mud volcanoes to strikes of tectonics uh, in the 4B area of the Columbus Basin. Um, before I get going, though, I'd like to thank the, uh, the rest of the NICO Trinidad team because uh, it's not just my work that's gone into this, it's the work of others as well. I'd like to thank BG Trinidad and um, NICO were a partner with them in the 5C blocks adjacent to this and they kindly allowed me to show a, a map to give a more regional overview that incorporates some of that uh, seismic mapping. And um, Devon Energy, my former employer, that uh, allowed me to show some examples um, from the Canadian Beaufort Sea that I think might have some relevance to what we're looking at here. So the basic outline of the talk will be uh, introduction and regional geology. Uh, then I'll get into the 3D seismic interpretation of the main data set that we're looking at in 4B. Um, then there'll be a more detailed dis discussion and some examples of mud volcanoes. Um, and then I'll talk about pre-stack depth migration and improvements in imaging how that can help us with our understanding of this type of area. Uh, then I'll go through some ABO inversion that's been done in the area, uh, followed by some conclusions. So, first of all, uh, on, on your left here, we got a free air gravity map of the greater Trinidad area. So we've got the island of Trinidad here and the coastline of Venezuela. Um, some of the I guess 4B is situated here in the Columbus Basin. Um, some of the main elements that, that define the basin, um, are, well, you've got the interaction of the Caribbean plates up here with the, with the South American plates, and the sense of motion there is, is that of sort of oblique conversion and, and right lateral wrenching, and that, that becomes quite important in uh, setting up a lot of structures in, in this area. Um, some of the other main features closer into to Trinidad are the, the Tobago High and the Northern Ranges. Then a little south of this, we've got the Central Ranges and the, the Darien High that goes into the offshore. It's sort of the equivalent of the Central Ranges onshore. Um, we've got a large subduction zone way out into the ultra deep water here and an accretion prison. Uh, and then we've got the Orinoco Delta, of course, which is been an important sediment source for this area for a long time. And then the passive, the more sort of passive continental margin here of South America. Um, this figure on the right here, I'll, I'll show a more zoomed in view of, of this shortly, um, again shows the location of 4B and it illustrates some of the style of uh, deformation that we have associated with this right lateral motion of the two plates. Um, we can see that onshore and into the Darien High Area offshore, we've got a combination of uh, right lateral strikes at vaulting. Um, there's a fair bit of compression here associated with the, the central ranges as well. Um, but as we get more out into the, the Columbus Basin, uh, the structural style becomes more dominated by, by extensional faults, the sort of large listric faults that we associate with uh, a lot of other tertiary deltas worldwide. Um, so this is a even more zoomed in view now, uh, showing uh, some of the compressional features that we have in 4B and, and these, these extensional, these normal faults here. Um, and I'll show some, some better examples on the seismic later, but um, these features were active synchronously. We'll see that from the, from the seismic data set. And an important model to keep in mind here is this deformation that we would get from, from a right lateral uh, strain ellipse here. Um, so with this, this right lateral sense of motion, it sets up a direction of uh, maximum compressive stress this way and minimum compressive stress perpendicular to it. Um, so, so the types of features that we get anticlines, in particular go, going from northwest to southeast in this area, and extensional faults uh, going from um, sorry, that's 
east, south, west, and then north, west, south, east for the extension of um, So keep this one in mind for later. Um, to show some sort of regional seismic to start with, the, these are a couple of traverses uh, put together from various 2D lines and, and some 3D as well. Um, and I hope you can make out some of these, these location maps here. But basically this first one, it goes from the Darien High area um, that's characterized by uh, this fairly ugly seismic data, to be honest. Um, this, this is on trend with our, our 2AB block here that Nike was quite familiar with. It. There's some tough players there for sure. Um, but we've got basement blocks and uh, Cretaceous and so on, but quite close to the surface here. And the style is uh, very much compressional, uh, at least in this view. But, but there is a fair bit of strike to vaulting in there too. Um, same story with this traverse as well, this is uh, just slightly offsetting. And then getting into the 4B block, or away, away from this ridge here, we see these much better imaged, um, but quite high relief um, anticlines. You know, they're, they're tightly folded, lots of, lots of structural relief on them. Then we drop down into the, the 4B area, and as we come, come across the block, um, the folds get broader and lower relief, so we're getting away from, from that compressional influence. And then see over here, there's, there's a hint of some growth faulting coming out of the vein, so that's how we sort of transition into the area dominated by those district faults. Um, so I'm not going to be saying a, a lot about the detailed stratigraphy on this but I feel I, I ought to introduce what we're looking at here. Um, it's more of a seismic bias to it, but um, we're going to be focusing mainly on the Pleistocene section here. It's, um, and what we're looking at initially is a sort of prograding wedge um, that becomes more aggradational in this area through, throughout the, Pleist the Pleistocene. Um, in terms of depositional environment, we're looking at uh, shore face delta to slope in this area, uh, we believe. Um, and over, I mean, the, the actual sands themselves in, in this area tend to be quite mature. Uh, they're very fine to fine grained, uh, typically well rounded to well sorted. Um, most of the sediment would have come from the Orinoco Delta, um, but of course there is the potential for some to become more locally off, off highs associated with the Trinidad area, Central Range area. Um, and the, in terms of the overall thickness, it, it's in excess of 10 kilometers thickness of Pleistocene section here. So by most standards, that's very rapid sediment deposition. Um, so we're dealing with a lot of overpressure potentially in this area, or we see that in a lot of the wells, and that's important later as well. Um, so overall, a, a marine regression. So to look in closer to um, where we are, uh, this this map's a little out of date. It's a uh, showing night acreage, and uh, but the key thing is block four B here. And we, we do see uh, a bit of data from, from 5C, which, as I said, we really sold to BG recently. Um, the, the key uh, data set that we're looking at is approximately 1,000 square kilometers of 3D seismic that, that covers 4B and then a, a bit into the adjacent block there with the, the Toucan development. Um, the record length is about eight seconds. Uh, that's necessary because we are dealing with such a thick section. Um, sample interval of two milliseconds and cable length of 4,800 meters. So that allows us to do some ADO work. Uh, it's meaningful to a reasonable depth. Uh, this survey was in initially shot by Conoco in 1997 and uh, since NICO picked up the clock in uh, 2010, 2011, uh, we, we had uh, CGG do some reprocessing of it. So, um, that's led to some significant improvements in image quality. Um, so it's a pretty good quality data set. Um, in terms of activity that's gone on in the Columbus Basin uh, to date, I mean, it's the success rate is, has been quite high. I don't know the exact numbers, but there's some very prolific gas fields nearby and, and comes more oil prone to the west. Um, you'll notice the, from the layouts of a lot of these fields that they are following that Listrick normal fault trend down here, but there's also a trend that um, goes from the northwest to the southeast. Um, so 
in the sort of uh, um, stratigraphic dip direction, if you like, so from southwest to northeast, there was normal faults of the important structural element. But to get that long strike closure, um, that subtle folding that I alluded to um, from, from the compression further up, that's really important. Um, so to get into some detailed interpretation now, uh, I'll just show you this one by way of a quick introduction to what we're, the sort of data set that we're dealing with now. It, it's not entirely straightforward. Um, and this is a rather complicated traverse from the, the Toucan area here, um, way out into the further west, into the black, into the last Quaybus well, that's the only well that's been built in Corby, and then back in towards uh, the edge of the 5C block. So this is this is kind of close to the turtle well, but not quite. Um, and the key reflectors that I picked here, uh, well, to use 5C terminology, would be the, the I sand, the G sand, and the, the D sand. So you'll see those reflectors a lot on, on subsequent maps and lines. Um, so this kind of traverse illustrates the, uh, the two different structural styles that we appear to have here. So we've got these large extensional faults that you, you come across when you go in the southwest to northeast direction. Um, and then these uh, uh, high amplitude faults here. Um, quite often into the normal faults you see significant growth um, that, that extends way up the section. And over the faults we see um, a thickening off and thinning over the top into the very shallow section. So this is um, the, these features have been active synchronously and it's quite a tectonically active area um, and, and quite recently as well. Um, the last Quavus well um, didn't encounter really anything in the way of hydrocarbons or reservoir. Oh, sorry. sorry to interrupt, you're a natural seismologist, not geologist. So all these well names don't mean anything to me. Oh, I'm sorry. So is it possible? I don't know if you have that information. Some latitudes. No, no. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Um, I I don't know that off the top of my head. But but basically, uh, if we go back to our map here, the last Quavus well is located in the eastern part of 4B. The Toucan development is straight west of that, and the 5C area consists of of Dal uh, our Bounty, Endeavour. And then just off that is done. So there's not many wells that I'll be talking about here. It's a fairly lightly explored area. Um, so just try to keep those in mind, I guess, when I'm drawing my little location maps. Um, okay, so yeah, um, so we, we see the these two styles of uh, deformation that are kind of consistent with our, our right lateral strain ellipse model here. So to look at the I sand time structure over the, um, the 4B block and then down into this 5C area here across to the west towards Toucan, um, you know, we, we see these north, um, northeast to southwest trending anticlines. It's one, two, three here that get progressively lower relief as we, we go down towards the south and east. Uh, and then as, you know, 5C is in kind of a real low here, so it's a pretty gutsy decision to, to actually drill there. The dolphin field had already been found, and that's, that's set up in the, uh, basically in the foot wall of one of these large mystic faults. Um, but, but the whole uh, Endeavour Bounty area is this, this small wrinkle and this huge low, so uh, you've got to go about 20,000 feet or so to get to the ice sand, so, so good, for, good for them that they drilled it, but uh, it's a brave decision. Um, so, yeah, we're, so we're, we're going to mostly focus on, on the, this area here in 4B. So to look at, uh, you know, to look at a, um, a view that just shows the compressional style of it, well, um, you know, where this is the higher amplitude uh, ridge to the, further to the north here. And you can see evidence for um, the, the timing of the 
growth. This is active throughout, um, maybe sporadically throughout the I sound to D sound times and later, and then, and then probably quite a bit before. Um, it was quite a challenging data set to interpret this one, as you could maybe gather from that first slide showing the uh, traverse there. Um, so what I did was pick a fault framework first, so about over 100 faults, and then uh, was able to slice the data set so that I'd be going along fault planes and staying within the fault block, so I wasn't running into problems of, of trying to uh, map out close to the plane of a fault and be taking a growth wedge over an anticline that you can get into a real mess if, uh, if you're not well organized about mapping your faults first. Um, so this is a perpendicular view now from the southwest to the northeast, and it shows a completely different style of deformation. Um, so we've got these large offsets, extensional faults here, and th these ones are actually counter-regional. Um, you know, the, the dolphin field, it's got um, similar or even larger size uh, fault offsets, and they, they go exactly the other way. Um, so we, we get regional, the regional ones here tend to be quite small offset in Fort Reed for whatever reason. And again, we've got evidence of a lot of, a lot of growth uh, like recently here. Um, so this, these are the classic sort of district faults you can get associated with large deltas worldwide. And uh, you know, here's another view here of the sort of next uh, syncline over. This is the next one to the north. Um, so again, one of these really large counter-regional faults with a bit of a rollover anticline here. Uh, and it, this is getting over towards the two can. Um, in terms of water depth, they were getting from so, uh, fairly, fairly shallow, about 100 meters or so, to over 400 meters deep. Um, so the, the structures that I've got mapped out, uh, they, I'll just go through the, the three main maps here quickly. Um, the the D sand. Uh, is the shallowest one, and you know we've got this large, quite well-defined uh, anticline here, but with a couple of independent closures. Actually, there's independent four-way dip here, and then this one kind of amalgamates with this other anticline here. We got a up throw of our slot that, that connects the two. So, in terms of from an exploration point of view, um, you know you've got independent closure here and here that spills a bit off the edge. Mostly within 4B. And th this is the structure that Las Cuevas was, was drilled on. Um, so at this particular level, it seems to be within structural closure, but uh, it's not the case at all levels, and it's uh, possible that, you know, if you were to depth convert that, it might not even be within any structural closure, but they, they had no reservoir in any cases. Failed for a couple of reasons. Can you tell from this analysis how? basically for most of the record length of the data. And I mean, it's a very thick section here. Isn't it? But what does that translate to in kilometers? Um, sort of at least eight kilometers or so. Um, so yeah, this is the GSAN structure, which mirrors the, the zone above it quite closely. And then this will be the, the ice sand, so the deepest one we're going to look at in detail today. So and here's our last wave as well as well. It's really on the edge of that closure. Um, spill points right here to the north. Uh, and you can see our the fault planes and these large counter-regional faults here. And, uh, right, right up to here as well. So, um, so the last wave as well, as I said, it's, it's um, a little doubtful as to whether it was drilled on the best defined structure. And uh, th this is this is a structure associated with it. We don't get much in the way of interesting amplitude anomalies, um, you know. And as an explorationist, uh, I'm more interested in amplitude anomalies in in this type of section um, where it's all plastics. It's relatively poorly consolidated, high porosity. Um, if you've got a significant gas accumulation. Uh, 
and you're going to get an amplitude, you're going to get a bright spot of some sort. On the other hand, if you have bright spots, it doesn't mean there's gas. Amplitudes can mean a lot of things. Um, so, you know, this is another view of uh, some interesting amplitudes going roughly south to north here. Yeah. Um, so this area will be, will be this high and then, and then this high will translate to here. And, you know, we, we see much more interesting stuff going on over these other anti -fans. First of all, I'd like to talk about the amplitudes here. Um, so that this one in particular, um, let's, let's take a closer look at, at that. Um, so this is what I, I call the Christmas tree structure. Um, I don't think I'm the first one to call it that, so I think, I think the term's been coined quite a few times before. Um, so some of the characteristics of this are that we've got this zone, quite a narrow zone of, uh, of very poor reflectivity, so there's basically no reflective continuity, it's very low amplitude, very chaotic. Um, and then immediately adjacent to that, we've got this stack of high amplitude reflectors. Now, now this, this area of low amplitude is sort of, it, if you were to slice it in other orientations, it would show the same width. It's, it's a pipe shape that's sub-vertical, um, or to vertical. And then these high amplitude events here obviously represent some sort of more compacted material. Um, you know, it's a hard interface, it's the same polarity as the sea flow. Um, so, you know, this of course is a mud volcano, and these, these bright events here represent mud flows at different times. So you, uh, you had the mud and rocks and so on, uh, whatever material came from deeper, uh, that would have been expelled, and then you'd have had a period of relative quiescence, and then, you know, where you had sediment infilling the space around it, followed by another burst of activity. And this one's uh, uh, long since dead, and there's no expression of it on the seafloor, and we get this sort of high amplitude cap to it here. So this is probably the last activity. Um, and what I've done, I mean, all of the side examples I'm showing you now are in the Petrel software, and it's very useful for looking at things in 3D, very, very powerful software. And one of the nice things it allows you to do is to do this multi-Z interpretation. So as the, as the name implies, for any given XY coordinate, um, you can have more than one Z value. I think it was originally developed for uh, mapping cell diapers and the place you had to go from Mexico where you need a, a really good velocity model to work with that. So, but it's been quite useful here. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, but so to go and, and then to, to, to look at other bright spots, I'll, I'll talk more about potential direct hydrocarbon indicators later. Um, but you can see that the character of this is, is very different to, to potential gas. Um, first of all, the polarities are, so that's the, the dead giveaway there, and, uh, and you don't get this classic uh, sort of Christmas tree structure. You know, that, uh, but, but basically, this is a seismic, seismic soft response, and that's a seismic hard response. Um, so, just to talk a bit about what uh, mud volcanoes are and how they form, most of you will be familiar with this one. It's in Paro uh, in southern Trinidad, southern or central Trinidad here. Um, and this is one of the smaller ones on the big scheme of things. Uh, they range in size from a sort of metre scale um, to, I think, the biggest one in the world is in Indonesia. It's uh, 10 kilometres across and 700 metres high. Uh, obviously, they occur onshore and offshore. Um, the preservation potential of this one isn't very high. It will probably not get eroded, but if you could imagine it being deposited on the seafloor, you'd get uh, sediments on mapping onto it until another burst of activity. So that sort of gives that classic Christmas tree shape. Um, so they, they expel any combination of mud, rocks, water, gas, oil, minerals, um, so any of the above or some of the above. Um, and they form in response to tectonic activity. Um, and typically the best conditions are overpressure, um, so sediments that haven't dewatered very well because they've been buried rapidly, and hydrocarbon generation seems to you know, play a bit of a role in that as well. Uh, so, well, at least 
some of the most prolific areas in the world for mud volcanoes are uh, hydrocarbon bases as well. So out in the South Caspian has about half of them, the known ones in the world. Um, Gulf of Mexico has a lot, Indonesia, and I've seen them in the Canadian Bofor Sea as well. Uh, so I talked about that seismically hard response to the mud flows, and I, I thought an interesting exercise would be to look at the ones we have on the, the sea floor at the moment before we, there are quite a few examples. Um, so this is a, a, a map of the thymetry contours uh, with sea floor amplitude superimposed on it. And you have to look past this rather ugly acquisition footprint here. Um, but if you do, you'll see these circular to elliptical shaped uh, buildups. Um, and, and, and these are the mud volcanoes. So you'll notice how they form these two, two trends here. And then there's a few over here as well, the mud are doing that. They, they line up with the ridges that I've mapped out before. Uh, but interestingly, the, the red is high amplitude. Um, the, the flows coming out of these uh, present day mud volcanoes are higher amplitude than the surrounding sea flow. So it kind of fits nicely with our ancient examples. And if we use a bit of opacity, or transparency, I should say, on the, on the sea floor, um, you know, we can see the, the, mud, the ancient mud volcanoes as well that I mapped out beneath this. So they were the brown things you were looking at, you might notice in the time structure maps. Um, so, you know, so the, even the dormant ones are sort of lying along the same trends as the, the modern ones. So we, these ridges are quite long lived features and, and I think the mud volcanoes are forming in response to the tectonic activity that you know they're not driving any uplift of the ridges um, but they are going to tend to expel their fluids uh, where the zones of weakness in the overburden so over a large anticline away you've got extensional faults intersecting with it. I think there's there's some evidence that you've got strikes at faults running through the ridges as well. I don't think there's much Natural displacement. So the, again, this is how they, they map out at the GSAM level. So I, I think it's you know important to distinguish where these areas are because obviously you know where where they're not uh, potential exploration targets. So this is uh, an example of a good accumulation of you know this is one of the older mud volcanoes here where you do have these. Uh, mud flows in the subsurface, and by doing detailed uh, sort of auto picking uh, uh, based on seismic character, you can you know map out numerous examples of these, and you know that, that's the scale there on the top. So some of these flows are going for quite a few kilometers, and they're, they're probably one of the better indications of uh, paleo sea floor topography if that was something in, someone was interested in. So, you know, some of them are more complex than just uh, straightforward pipes of the Christmas tree structures around. Um, this one, for example, uh, started growing in the, this position, and, and you know, you see the classic sort of bright spots associated with it. But then the activity stopped here, and it shifted across to here, and started uh, building up, and it's penetrating through the sea floor today. Uh, so, the evolution of these. Quite complicated. Um, if we go back to that line that I showed you initially, um, clearly, you know, that this is one of the Christmas trees I was showing you earlier, but on this, this ridge to the north, uh, we see this big cone on the sea floor. I mean, this is obviously a modern day mud volcano. And as you look down to the section, you see this area of deformation here, or could be some sort of gas chimney effect. But the polarity here is all wrong. Don't really see any down here. So this is probably quite a recent one. You know, either that or the flows weren't preserved. But, but more likely the activity on this one has all been much more recent than say over here. <coughs> so you can figure out by the timing as well. Um, so that kind of leads me into the, the next bit of the talk. So you know obviously you've got areas where you, you have intense mud volcano activity. And, and areas, this is on the same mountain line, a bit to the southwest. And you can actually see bedding pretty 
failing through this. Um, so I know some, some of my colleagues in the past have looked at these ridges and termed them shale ridges or shale areas. Um, and I, I don't think you can really do that um, because obviously there's a lot of variation around them. Um, and to be honest, I, I'm not a big believer that there's as many shale areas out as, as people would have you believe. Um, in my, I've never seen a good one in outcrop, uh, for example. I've never seen a really good one on, on high quality depth migrated 3D seismic. Uh, they tend to occur mostly on poor quality older 2D seismic. That's, that's my observation. Um, so anyway, I think you have to always do the best you can to image uh, uh, sleeping different reflectors um, for any exploration target. I'm a big fan of restack depth migration since I <clears throat> since I worked in the Canadian Boat Flood Sea and depth and energy have kindly given me permission to show this example. Um, so this this is way up north in the Arctic. Um, you know you've got the basically Alaska. This this map show you know from Google Earth. This is the actual Mackenzie Delta itself. It's a huge um, tertiary delta system on the scale of the Arctic. It's the second biggest river in North America, basically, after the Mississippi. Um, and you, you've got Alaska kind of over here. Um, in this basin, it, it's not unlike the Columbus Basin in some ways, thinking about it. You've got um, the main tectonic elements of this ancient rift margin here to the east. Um, that, so the gateway to, to passive margin style sedimentation of the tertiary. And then later on, you've had a mountain building that come across from the southwest. So you've got the overprint of this compression over, over some extension. And the main style of this sort of red area, it's hard to see, is um, basically like actual wrench fault um, that's set up over these highs. That, but they're not the simple elongate anti climb you get in the west. They're um, more complicated structures, a bit like we, we see at Fort Bean. Um, but nonetheless, this is an example from a uh, quite a good quality 3D data set that Devon acquired um, early 2000s. And this was, you know, it explained to me that this is a shale diet here. Um, and it looks sort of superficially like the, the structures one might see in the Gulf of Mexico or the North Sea. Um, this is the, the thick tertiary deltaic sequence here. So we're going from Eocene to, you know, present day. Um, but we've got these nice alternating sand and shale beds here, very well imaged in the syncline areas, and then there's this apparent abrupt truncation against this zone of very poor reflectivity. Uh, and like the Columbus Basin, this is all overpressure, very rapid sediment deposition. Um, so all the conditions you think might be right, you've got thinning over the top of this thing, so the thought was this, this a kind of um, extruded from depth and, and deformed all the beds over the top of it. Um, so, but this feature over here uh, was a gas discovery, and that's obviously just an anticline. So, um, what happens when we we start depth migrate this? Well, we go from you know this is our time image, and this is our depth image. So, the time processing and dragging out all the uh, steeply dipping events is noise. Um, and doesn't and generally assumes a layer cake geology. Uh, no anisotropy, no big lateral changes in velocity. Um, whereas you know the PSDM was actually done uh, for those that care about these things. Um, so usually you do Kirchhoff migration or wave equation migration. Kirchhoff kind of models a wave path and wave equation is models the entire wave front. This is called beam migration. It was proprietary for applied geophysical services at the time. And it's kind of a hybrid between the two. So it doesn't model the full wave front, but a sort of portion of it. Um, and they had very, very efficient code. Um, they could run an iteration on 400 square k's overnight, which was sort of unheard of there, but they can do it in about two minutes and a half. Um, so that's one, one view there. And then this is moving a bit further along the structure. And even on this time migrated data set, you can, you can sort of see a bit of reflectivity here. But, you know, 
Well, on the depth migrated one, you've got really complex but rubber lift and folding of beds. Um, this is quite broad and consolidated material, so it can fold very, very easily um, due to the uh, strikes that tectonics are getting here. And I've just sort of highlighted this section where, where it appears to be thickening into the structure, and that's the exact opposite relationship you can get above. So, so my thoughts for how it might have evolved are summarized in this series of uh, diagrams below. So you've got um, a pot potentially uh, an extensional fault system here, uh, which could be brought the influence of the mountain building when we're in that passive margin type setting. So growth faulting for these older sediments, and then subsequent uplift, uh, you know, inversion of this fault system, and then and then erosion over the top of the structure. So like so. Um, so that's this is an example of how, how depth imaging in a, in a similar setting can completely change your ideas. Um, so with that in mind, uh, actually, uh, well, independently of this uh, process. Uh, uh, took the liberty of, of doing some testing of the that depth migration of data in the hopes that we would uh, buy that volume as well. And the uh, uh, guy that worked on this project before me wasn't such a good believer in TSDM, so, so I didn't really push for it, which was kind of disappointing. But I'll show you a series of um, images that compare the time with the depth imaging. And they're not as dramatic as the 24 c example do show an improvement. So that's time, that's depth. So if you focus in this area here, say, you'll see that when we go to depth, um, everything's much sharper. It's higher amplitude in the, within the structure here um, because the, these individual events, are, well, the gathers are much flatter. So everything's stacking much more. You know, the, uh, the stack is very forgiving in, 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 if the move out problems are horrible because you can just sort of mute it or, or not really too careful and you'll, you'll get something. Uh, but, but when you take care to get the velocities right, uh, you know, you'll get these nice continuous events here. Um, so this is another part of the structure, so before and after. And it's just, I think, a pretty significant improvement in image quality. Uh, th these are some cross site examples now, so they're going to be more biased towards the extensional faults. Uh, so this is before and after. And notice how much crisper those extensional fault planes are. Then, I just got one more to show here. So, yeah. so it's moving things laterally a little bit as well, um, which you know would be concerning if you were going to drill based on. So, you know, that, that's uh, just the, all I had to say on depth imaging, really. So, to go to the ADO inversion part of the talk, uh, this really is to talk about the amplitudes of interest that are not in the volcanoes. Uh, and if we just look at um, a sort of northwest southeast line here, it's uh, actually not showing up very well on the map, but it should be. Uh, yeah, it's this orientation here. Um, we see one of our uh, one of our mud volcano structures here, um, but stepping away from that onto this this other area of closure here, we got these really interesting bright spots and flat spots here um, with the with an acoustically soft top to them, so the exact opposite polarity to the mud volcanoes. We do, and, and these are actually some of the flows that I've mapped in the book. Um, so so exact opposite polarities. Um, so to investigate these further, um, one obvious first step is to look at partial stacks. So uh, you know, on the, the far angle stack, uh, 32, to 42 degrees over this one particular feature, we see good conformance of, of high amplitude. This is strong negative amplitude, which is a uh, soft reflector. It conforms really well to structure, and you could almost believe there's a, a common contact here for gas. Um, so, you know, the ABO work consisted of two main stages, really. We, first of all, had the data. We did some modeling to see what type of response we should really expect, and 
but would the data be expected to, to help as much? Um, so one of the first steps was to plot the P wave velocity versus the, the shear wave velocity from up second levels. Uh, and you get this quite consistent relationship between the two as you'd expect. And, and this background trend is termed the, the mud rock line or the shale line. Um, and then obviously any deviation you get from this is of interest. And say here for example, for a given shear wave velocity, the, the P wave velocity is decreasing. So it's velocity tend to get attenuated in the presence of gas. So we're interested in data that lies to the, the left of this line, further away you get the more the greater the gas saturation. Um, so that that's that was encouraging to see that relationship there. Um, then we, we had some forward modeling done on the gas sound case versus brine sound case. So this is the brine, this is the gas, uh, that's the input wavelet here, and this is the zone of interest. So you know it's a few tens of meters thick. Uh, so it's not going to be too badly affected by tuning here at these depths. So that's nice. And I don't know how well you can make it out from further the back, but you can see the top of the sand is this onset of the trough here. And this is near offset to far offset. Basically, in the gas case, you're getting a much stronger trough. So it's a classic uh, type 3 response uh, in ABO terms. So then uh, there was some gather analysis done over these areas of interest. And you know we were, in fact, seeing most type 3, some type 4 anomalies that were coincident with, with our structure. So that was very encouraging. Um, and same for, same for one of these other features as well. Um, and then this is just a few examples from the actual, you know, so the next step was to um, do the ABO inversion and generate uh, um, output attribute volumes. And we, we found a couple of the useful ones to be P impedance and density, um, if you can believe density data is great, it's sort of like the, you know, the ultimates in uh, uh, having confidence you got a gas there, I think. Um, anyway, this is the edge of the toucan uh, field here. So you can see a very obvious response in density and uh, P impedance. And then we come down into 4B and up onto our structures of interest. And you see some, some very nice high amplitudes on the P and P's density, so we're pretty encouraged by that from an exploration point of view. And then here's some other views as well. Um, so just strictly on 4B here, the location map. So again, it's lighting up really nicely over, you know, these areas conform to four-way structure. This is a weird little host block that connects the two ridges together. Um, and then again, on this, this is getting really quite shallow, you're not far above the mud line here. Uh, but, you know, the, there's potential flanking plays as you get deeper down, so it's all, uh, of course, the timing of this growth is important too. And then some cross line views again. Um, so, we just did this ABO work on a, a subset of the Data set. And this, this is the extent to, to where we looked at it because we felt that the Las Cuevas well, obviously didn't have any reservoir. Uh, you're in a, basically a structural low down here. So we wanted to see which of these attributes really confirm to structural highs. Um, so I think it's quite a nice fit of the, the P impedance. This is in the D to I sand interval. So it's, it's taking the um, average values there. Uh, so, so it fits very nicely to structure, and it's encouraging that, that it does a two count as well. But I'm not an ABO expert, so I didn't do this work myself. Um, but our, our contractor, Scott Jameson, who did it, uh, people neglected to tell him that this was a gas field here. Um, so, but he still managed to find it. It's quite the best for that. Uh, this is the bulk density display. Uh, again, showing a very nice performance of. Uh, the low density indicating gas to structure. And then if we sort of look at it in all 3D, you know, 3D view, um, you can 
see quite nicely, this is, this is the ice sand structure. We've got our, our fault planes here, these big country regional faults. And then where these are intersect, where these normal faults are intersecting the ridges, uh, we get accumulations of mud volcanoes along the ridges. And then these areas of red, of uh, geo bodies extracted from, from the P impedance and density bodies. So cross by the two volumes and taking the, the most southwesterly points in those uh, volumes, if you like, so the low values. So, yeah, that was basically the, the bulk of the presentation there. So, um, the main conclusions from this are that the compressional and extensional deformation occurs synchronously during the Pleistocene. Uh, and this was due to bilateral wrench faulting. Uh, mud volcanoes became active in response to this tectonic activity in the overpressure bioprocessing sediments. Uh, they're most active in the zones of structural weakness, so where you get faults intersecting the anticlines. Um, but PSDM can yield significant improvements in the imaging of these complex structures. Uh, anticlines in 4B are likely to have reservoir sands present crests as well as on the plants. You know, that's, that's an important thing to bear in mind that you know, PSDM supports that that is a continuous succession over the structure. Um, and then potential DHIs are actually quite easily distinguished from mud volcanoes. So thank you very much.
So really we have no evidence and we wouldn't expect to see any earthquake activity being related to the extraction of hydrogen. Well that's the answer I normally give because the depth at which we see the
So you're taking a crest and then you're uplifting it even further on the upturn side. So you're really producing the overload of pressure on the pore pressure, which is an ideal spot for everything to burst. And you, 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 you reach pore pressure, seal, seal capability. Uh, so that's sort of that's. I mean, the main one, of those. Yeah, one thing that's certain though is they, they do line up right in trend with the with the anti -flags. So But do they do they coincide with these major brute force at parts? Um, the the normal parts. <laughs> Thank you. 